him a base many grace. lesson is from the book of Numbers. From Mount the Lord, the Israelites set out by way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The 
people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? But there is no food, no water, and we detest the miserable food. Then the Lord sent poison serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze, put it upon a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person who looked at the serpent of bronze and lived. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Our song, please. We will reply responsibly. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, and His mercy endures forever. Let all those whom the Lord has redeemed for the rain, that He redeemed them from the hand of the Lord. He gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some of the rules and slaves were rebellious ways. They were afflicted because of their sins. They abhorred all manner of food and drew near to death's door. And then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent forth his word and healed them and saved them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his mercy. And the wonders he does for his children. Let them offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and tell of his acts his self to joy. Our second lesson is from Ephesians. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived following the course of this world, following the rule of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of the flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace we have been saved, and raised up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved, Faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the results of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what He has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Son of man be lifted up, 
that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, for the light has come into the world, <coughs> and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Jesus-centered life. The seven practices that make up the way of love are turn, learn, and pray. And these last three weeks we looked at each of those. Worship, which we will look at today. And bless, go, and rest, which we'll look at in the next weeks. We're taking a little break for Easter. The liturgical colour for this week is actually pink, or more accurately described as rose, the rose colour. Um, at this time we have, I only have a rose coloured stole and we have a chasm velvet rose that someone gave us from another church that was closing, sadly. But the chasm velvet was obviously made for about a six foot four man because it's absolutely enormous. We don't have pink this pink hangings, pink, any of the other things that are pink. So we haven't made the switch over to pink yet. But I thought today I would at least wear the pink stole. And you'll see I've got my pink clothing shirt on. There's only two days, I mean partly why we have we don't purchase the pink ones is there's only two days in the liturgical calendar where pink is the liturgical colour. This Sunday and the third Sunday in Advent. And the colour pink, or rose, as it's more aptly described, is the idea that there is joy. Rose represents the colour of joy. But it's the joy that's found in a time of penitence and fasting, in a hard time. It's not the flimsy happiness. It's the deep joy that we find sometimes, even in the midst of really hard times. And this week in Lent, and that third week in Advent, represents this idea that we're on this journey, and we can see the end in sight, and there's joy. It's like we, we're going to make it. We've made it so far, and we're going to make it through. And I think particularly this year, with everything we, that's been going on for all of us, let alone the pandemic, is this wonderful sense that God would have us recognize that we're almost there. 
that the celebration of Easter is almost here, that we have made it this far, and we will make it. Today, the topic is worship. And of course, in our liturgical tradition, we use all manner of elements to worship with different colored vestments. That's one thing I love about our church, all the different colors. We'll see if we turn into Holy Week that everything will turn to red. And then when we turn to Easter, everything will turn to white. Vestments, music, beautiful worship music that we appreciate. Candles, various items of beauty and significance, all kinds of artistic expression, all kinds of forms of different ways of worshiping God within, the, within our setting of the church. And in some churches, incense. But I have to tell you, if I ever brought up the idea of having incense here, I'd be sent out the door. Because yeah. for many of us, incense is, it irritates us. It's not something. But it's, if you're in a big church, if you've ever been to a big church, a cathedral, and they have incense, it is another whole kind of experience. And maybe some of us have used incense at home, and it just gives a whole other sense. So worship for us, in our tradition, involves all of our senses. Sight, sound, touch, taste, and smell. Taste. Taste and see that the Lord is good as we receive the elements of bread, and hopefully not too long away, wine too. In the book that Deacon Jackie and I have used yeah. over the years in our newcomers class, introducing people to the Episcopal tradition, it's called Those Episcopals, spelled with a K. Dennis Maynard describes worship in two ways. One, he said, worship is like, when you think of the name the word worship, you think of the word worship. We're giving God God's word. And that's a kind of, you know, that's that idea of adoration. But as my son tells me, <laughs> well, I don't understand that whole thing about why would God want, God want people to just bow down in adoration before God? Isn't that rather like arrogant and self-centered and narcissistic? So for some of us, we've been around those people that seem to crave our worship, but it's not a pleasant <laughs> experience. So yeah, there's some kind of what does it mean to worship God in that way? But he also offers in that book another definition, which I really, at this season of my life, really gravitate towards. And he says this, worship is the attempt to create an atmosphere in which we can know God's love and make God's love known. Worship is the atmosphere, it's what we create here so that we will know God's love, make God's love known. I know for myself, before I became a priest, I would visit several churches, and there were some churches I went to, I ended up feeling worse when I left than when I came in. It didn't feel loving, it felt very shaming, it felt very controlling, it felt very unreal. But I love this idea that worship is about love. And one of the things I've loved this last couple of weeks as we're all starting to return to church, is the noise when we come into church. People are chatting to one another and glad to see one another. There's love here. There's warmth here. There's a welcome here. I don't know, do you recall a time in your life when you tried to create a special atmosphere to communicate to someone how much you love them? Perhaps it was a special meal. Perhaps it was a proposal of marriage. Perhaps it was a family member's visit. Or maybe just a celebration that someone came through a hard time or an illness and you're just so glad that they're recovering. Maybe for that special meal you made something special, you bought some flowers perhaps, you put some nice music on, maybe you burnt some lovely scented candles. All of those things that you do when you try to make something, you provide a way of people recognizing that you really do love them, those are all outward and visible signs of an inward love, aren't they? And that's the same thing in the church, what we call worship, with our worship. The vestments, the readings, the prayers, the music, the Eucharistic rite, 
or we eat bread and wine. These are outward and visible signs of an inward spiritual reality of our love for God. More importantly, God's love for us. We sang that hymn this morning, Amazing Grace. There's grace mentioned in the readings today. I'm not so keen on that first line. Amazing grace that saves a wretch like me. I've, I've struggled with that. I like to save a soul like me. But there's grace. God loves us. There's nowhere we can go. There's nothing we can do that God puts us outside of God's love. There's no situation that we can go through that God is not there for us with God's love. People may be there with their judgment. The voices in our head may be judging us. But God is there to love on us. And the idea of gathering together on a Sunday is that we celebrate that love of God and the love that we have for one another. I think worship is a universal instinct, isn't it? We all want to reach for something higher than ourselves. We might witness the flight of an eagle, the stillness of a dewy morning, an open starlit sky. There's something in us that lifts ourselves, wants to be lifted to something greater than us, vaster than us, more powerful than us, the mystery beyond all that we can know. It's also been said that worship is something we do together. It's not a, it's not a show. It's not a spectator sport. In fact, the word liturgy in the Greek is made up of two different words. The first word is layoff, which means work. And the second word is ergon, which means people. So there's this sort of combination of work and people. And there's been some debate about exactly what that means. Isn't that curious? The church is debating what things mean, you know? And you've got people on different sides saying, oh no, it means this, oh no, it means that. So on one side, you've got people who said, no, it means the work of the people. And on the other side, you've got people saying, no, it means the work for the people. And traditionally, over the years, the people who believed it meant the work for the people were those who didn't feel like the laity should really be involved in worship, but really it's something that the professionals do and the people just come and sort of absorb it. And on the other side of the liturgical spectrum is those who say, no, God wants everybody's gifts to come in worship, all, all that we are. And so it's, we do this thing together. Well, I think like most arguments, so you've got either or, a little of both and can be kind of helpful. It is the work of the people, isn't it? It's amazing to think that just by showing up, we bring something to this. Even if we don't speak to anybody or do anything or serve in any way, just by being here, we are worshiping together. That the gift of ourselves is enough for God and for one another. So it is the work of the people. But it's also, isn't it, the work for the people. When I think of the people who participate in making this possible for us, the greeters, the ushers, the lectors, the lambs, the music, there are many people involved, even just the simple act of cleaning the sanctuary so that it's clean and especially at this time, healthy for us all. There's a lot of us, a lot of people, aren't there, that are involved, a lot of us are involved, setting up the altar. So in many ways, worship is for the people too. And many of us have a role, or have had a role, at different times in our lives. Some of us used to be very involved, and now maybe we're not able to be so involved. But the important thing is that we are here together to worship as the collective body of Christ. We're here to be with God, to absorb and recognize God's incredible love for each one of us, and to be together in this sense of God's enfolding love around us. As we sing, or pray, or in silence, 
Does the word speak to you first? Does we meditate? Does we read the scriptures? Does we just look around and maybe focus on something and let it just speak to us? Does we light a candle, either in memory of somebody or as a prayer? Worship. Bless the Lord, my soul, and bless the Lord's holy name. Bless the Lord, my soul, who leads me into honor. Let's stand together and turn to the night we believe. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. Eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, through your God from your God, begotten of the name of the one being with the Father. Through him all things are made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and of the same man. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord our Creator of life. Who proceeds from the Father and the Son? With the Father and the Son, He is rich and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. And that our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to those parted eternal rest. Let the light perpetually shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. The prayers are invited for Jerry and Ron, Roseanne and Perry, Gordon and Florence, who live in healthcare situations, Richard and Mary, Anne Marie, Trisha, Dawn, Sam, Claudia, Linda, Donna, Gerard, Marilyn, Trish, Vernon, Danny, Karen. Father Mark Griffith, Fred, Diane, Daryl, Jim, Paul, Franklin, and his family, Sam and Mary Ann, Dwayne, Janet, 
Ron, Mike, Lloyd, Olive, Mercedes, Norma, Cindy, and Larry, and Heather. We also pray for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones at this time. In the diocesan side, we pray for Holy Cross Church in Winter Haven and St. Paul's Church in Winter Haven. In the Anglican side, we pray for Ecclesia Anglicana Yeshiva. Almighty God, by your Holy Spirit, you have made us one with your saints in heaven and on earth. Grant that in our earthly pilgrimage we may always be supported by this fellowship of love and prayer, and know ourselves to be surrounded by their witness to your power and mercy. We ask this for the sake of Jesus Christ, in whom all our intercessions are acceptable through the Spirit, and who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let's greet one another from our pews with a gesture of peace. Please have a seat. Your vestry met this week, and we've decided that it's time to uh, continue with the one service. You'll see the seating arrangement is slightly different today, so that we can get a few more people in, especially now people are getting their vaccinations. But we are asking that you would um, call Joan Graybill on, on, on the reservation line, uh, either her home or cell number, so that we can just get an idea of how many people we're expecting at Easter. So that we will just have that one service on Easter day. Uh, during Holy Week, we will not be having a service on Monday, Thursday, a live service. We're not allowed to do court washing this year. Um, so we'll be having our Monday, Thursday service via Zoom. And on Good Friday, we will be, I will be uh, conducting, we'll have our stations at the cross. But what we'll do is we'll remain seated and one person will just take a journey to each of the stations so that we can keep socially distant but still have our service of stations. And I also wanted to thank you all for your ongoing donations for the Salvation Army. Um, one of the things, of course, is there's a lot of fallout, isn't it, from this pandemic, and they'll continue to be so. Um, so any of those food contributions that you bring in, and I thank Marge at the moment, she's picking them up every week from Salvation Army so they quickly get distributed. And also in terms of blessing other people, it's always traditional in the Episcopal Church during Lent that one of the Sundays be allocated as a way of gathering in funds for the Episcopal Relief and Development Fund. And that's the Episcopal branch of uh, where we reach out to people here in the United States in you know, disaster relief of various kinds, pandemic relief, and then also overseas. So next week, I'm going to uh, encourage an in gathering of money for the Episcopal Relief and Development Fund. You can simply put it in an envelope, write Episcopal Relief and Development. If you want to combine it with the check you usually make, just put on the outside of your envelope how much is to come to the church and how much is to go to the Episcopal Relief and Development Fund. And that way we can work together to support all of those things around the country and the world. I also wanted to, uh, who noticed the beautiful beds out there? The change, it, isn't that a hopeful sign? It's lovely. And uh, you know, you'll see the holly bushes, we've cut them right back, you know, well we, I didn't do it. Um, because um, it, they, were, they were diseased and so they'll, they'll start to spring back and I think even that is a lovely hopeful sign, isn't it? I'm really grateful for the people that have uh, begun to do this for us. Olivia is our lead. Um, so Olivia has been working really hard with both her sister, Phyllis, and her brother, Ed, to do a lot of work out there. Ebby has also been uh, co-opted to carry out the honeydew list, haven't you, Eddie? So I really thank you for that, putting in all, some of the plants. And uh, it's a work in progress, so thank you for those who've helped. Um, I did put out a notice 
Uh, we do have a watering system, but we don't have a timer. So um, if anyone can help, just like, you have to water them every, uh, for 30 minutes every day. So if you want to help with that, if that's something you think you can come to do at the church, means coming down 30 minutes doing the watering. I want to let you know you have to be able to both bend down and get up again. <laughs> so the service can get down there, we can't get back up again. So this is the thing for you if that's, if that's for you. So um, just let me know if that's something you can help with. Um, I don't believe we have any birthdays. I know next Sunday is Dwayne's birthday, but do we have any, son any birthdays this week? I don't think so. Do we have any special anniversaries? No? Do we have anybody traveling anywhere? Not yet. But we're getting there, aren't we? Who's having thoughts about where they might go? Yes, the ideas are starting to percolate, aren't they? This is not going to last forever. So when it comes to it, we'll be happy to say those traveling prayers when the way begins to open up again. So let's turn as another act of worship to the Eucharist. Bread for the journey of life. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God. Joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, 
Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who was tempted in every way as we are, yet did not sin. By his grace, we're able to triumph over every evil and to live no longer for ourselves alone, but for him who died for us and rose again. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Passover is sacrificed. 
Christ for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. The gifts of God for the people of God. God's holy feast for God's holy people. I did want to mention too that at this time we continue to just receive in one time. Thank you. 